you very much for uh, the introduction. And thank you for staying here for the last presentation of Neurotechniques. Um, so today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the fusion, the, the merging, bringing together brain-computer interfaces and immersive virtual reality for post-stroke rehabilitation. Um, that's the main goal. So our goal is definitely to bring technology that can help patients and not the improvement of the technology per se. Um, I have shown this slide already, um, which basically shows um, how interdisciplinary we have to, to be uh, when we work here, because we have to, to work in the context of, uh, of uh, rehabilitation. And we know um, that um, there are some principles, some um, therapies, etc., that are effective, but can we improve them? And there is where we work together um, um, with collaborators, and we have to understand a little bit the neuroscience of recovery after stroke, in our case, to be able to bring new therapies that can be more effective through technology. Um, yesterday, you had a keynote on the use of virtual reality and stroke rehabilitation. We believe that virtual reality is a very powerful tool that can be used um, to drive uh, cortical plasticity and other, and other factors that uh, may be positive for, for recovery. And we will see now how we can bring this together with brain-computer interfaces. And finally, since we are dealing with a um, uh, population that has uh, limited uh, mobility issues, has most likely a paretic um, arm, it may have uh, cognitive issues, uh, may be computer illiterate. We have a human-computer interaction issue that we have to solve. And all of that in order to be able to create new paradigms that are more effective for rehabilitation. So our goal is to apply this, um, this strategy to stroke. I'm not going to say much about this because it has been said, right, the population is aging. We know we're going to have many more elderly in a couple of decades, and our health systems can simply not sustain the current rehabilitation we are doing. So we need new models that can uh, contribute to making sustainable the health solutions um, in this aging population. And one of the most uh, serious cases that we have is a stroke because um, just stroke alone is quantified to consume from 2 to 4% of all the healthcare costs in the world, which is a lot of money, right? And this is just going to get worse. So we have to find solutions now for the immediate future we will have in uh, one or two decades. And here is where we believe we need to try to find principles that do make the difference. And these principles are not technology. Technology is the way we implement these principles. So this is why we go and we try to study um, into neuroscience what are the, 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 the principles that could be exploited by, by our technology. Well, it is widely accepted that it's through cortical plasticity that uh, patients after stroke regain function, uh, basically networks, uh, brain networks, reorganize and take over the lost functions of these neurons that died after the stroke. And this is, this is known. And from rehabilitation practice, we know that there are a number of strategies you can use to foment, to, to push this rehabilitation uh, and this recovery through plasticity. One of them is treatment, frequency, and intensity. This is one of the, the, the main drivers of recovery. Second, the practice of a movement and its repetition. And third, the specificity of the training with respect to the deficits and the goals that we want to, to achieve in the rehabilitation program. And this is basically what is being done right now in the, um, in the clinic, trying to exploit these factors. Now, we also heard um, yesterday about the mirror neuron system. And I want to, to emphasize what the importance of this system is for us, because mirror neurons are multimodal neurons that are also in close relation with the motor system. Okay? Are neurons that can be activated through perception by looking at um, an avatar, 
by looking at a person or by looking at an animal or even by looking at the tool performing an action. And this is being understood by the brain and it activates the areas also responsible for performing this action in ourselves. So this can be an alternate network that can be used to access the motor system through perception. And this is where virtual reality, we think, may play a very important role. And um, through fMRI studies, it has been shown that these discoveries of, of the mirror neurons, we don't know if there exist these mirror neurons specifically, because we don't have um, direct recordings, but fMRI data reveals that there are sets of, ne uh, of neurons that behave like those mirror neurons detected in the, the monkeys by Rizzolatti uh, at all. Another thing that we uh, incorporate always in our systems is the challenge graduation. And since long time, and we can go back to the 1900 when uh, Jörges Dodson uh, formulated this uh, theory, when they saw that when we have a task where the, the, the per person, in this case was uh, rats, performing this task, had a low level of arousal of stress, they would perform low. When they had a lot of stress, arousal would perform low again, but intermediate points will, would perform uh, optimally. So this performance is a driver for learning. So if we want to learn, um, and rehabilitation is about relearning, then we have to find the sweet spot in um, um, intermediate stress levels. And these three things are things that we can um, incorporate into uh, systems that build on virtual reality. And virtual reality is the tool of choice here. And you have seen before a system like this, where um, we have patients that can interact with uh, virtual reality environments, and there you have uh, fully controlled environments that can provide minimally supervised training. We can have task-specific movement repetition, individualized training, and feedback for motivation and reward. Now, if you look at these words here, those are very similar to the messages we got from uh, rehabilitation practice. So those can be incorporated very easily into these systems. Further, neuroscience shows us that we are also responsive to seeing virtual bodies and interpreting them uh, through the mirror neuron system, and also that by looking at, um, at uh, a, an avatar in first-person perspective, we will get the, the, the largest um, activation. So it means that the technology we develop does have those concepts. We, have, we embed a person, a body, in first-person perspective, and we own a virtual body that's represented in this case as a hand that performs tasks. This you've seen before, and that's fine. That's fine for a number of patients in which we can close the act sense loop like this, when we have the brain sending motor commands, motor intents, and, and then we have activation from the motor areas, those go downstream, those are executed, and we can measure some of these through our sensors, and then these are mapped onto um, a virtual reality system that provides some feedback on how well we are performing. When we need some help, then we can use robotic systems like this. This is the, the dual um, uh, Armeo. That's a passive exoskeleton that removes gravity, so it facilitates movement. And here we have the, the Mayomo, which is an active uh, uh, EMG-driven um, exoskeleton that whenever it detects um, an action uh, intent in the muscle, it completes the movement with the robot. But unfortunately, these solutions are not applicable to all the patients. And when I talk about all the patients, is those patients that need the most new solutions are the ones that cannot benefit from the traditional rehabilitation. And those are actually the ones that may have um, very low range of motion, they may have pain, fatigue, etc., so they cannot practice those. May have flaccidity or spasticity, okay? So that impedes them from uh, performing 
the motor actions we want. And when we cannot do that, then we need to, to find other solutions to close that loop that I was talking about. And what we're using is brain-computer interfaces. We try to go and, and find the motor um, features that relate to motor intent. In our case, sensory motor rhythms. We detect them through EEG. And then we try to feed those into virtual reality to close this loop so that we have um, intent, action, perception loop in which patients can see, can have feedback on the performance, and they can learn uh, uh, about this, then driving plasticity more effectively. There are experiments. There's research being done in this context, like these ones here, that have shown that such research and improvements exist. Here you have an example of, um, on the left, a group that presented virtual hands presented where the actual hands would be. And when they would detect this motor intent from uh, sensory motor rhythms, would present in first person perspective a virtual hand closing. Okay? And in the other one would be uh, combined two with, a, um, with a robot to have the aid of the robot to complete um, uh, systems. These are systems that are actually exploiting that. Now I'm going to try to explain how we want to exploit um, motor imagery in the context of VR. And we have to start with explaining a little bit about motor imagery. And about motor imagery, we have to talk, obviously, um, about the activation of the, the brain areas that are active when we perform motor actions. Um, this is uh, well known um, around the central sulcus. We have uh, our uh, motor areas, and those are activated and those are excited uh, during the production of movements. And there is this homunculus, this is the, the image next there, that shows that there is not a random distribution of how this activation happens, but this, this maps the body somehow. So there is uh, localized activation. Uh, in the brain that could be exploited through, um, through brain-computer interfaces for that. What's the trick here? The trick is, it has been shown that the activation of the brain areas when we are performing a motor action is very similar and overlaps in a large extent with that activation that we have when we mentally simulate that we are performing those motor actions. Then, when we don't have motor capabilities at hand available, and that's the case of many of our patients, then this is a possibility because we can resort to ex uh, exciting brain networks responsible for motor action through the imagination of them. Okay? And that's what we want to exploit. Also, it has been shown that through motor imagery, the repetition of just imagining these, 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 these movements can induce plasticity and drive this plasticity that we need for recovery. And finally, there's uh, research showing that feedback combined with motor imagery also uh, enhances each effectiveness as compared to motor imagery alone. So these are things we know that we can exploit in our technology. The first thing we wanted to, to do in order to, to evaluate, OK, when we develop a, a system like this, where you see it's a virtual reality scenario where we have hands and these hands are performing actions. Do we really drive the mirror neuron system with this virtual reality technology? So we did an experiment with 18 right-handed uh, subjects, healthy subjects, in which they were performing several uh, uh, tasks here, observation and also uh, motor imagery, when observing um, uh, virtual reality images like these sequences of movements. What we found is that among other activations related to attention, etc., we saw a specific activation in areas that were uh, consistent with mirror mechanisms. So that means, effectively, when we use this type of technology combined with motor imagery, we can activate the mirror mechanisms. So now we are not only activating the, the, the motor areas, but also the mirror mechanisms. So this is good news again. 
So knowing this and starting from this basis, what, what we do is basically um, try to exploit the, the, um, the signature of this motor imagery imagination, um, which is known as the sensory motor rhythms. Sensory motor rhythms are this specific signature that you can measure through EEG at the scalp um, here, and basically over the motor areas. Many uh, neurofeedback systems uh, based on, on the motor imagery use electrodes that are lateralized, right and left, uh, C3, C4, or similar, to exploit this. So if we measure over the, the, um, the, the motor, sensory motor areas, we will be able to pick those. And then with um, um, electrophysiology, we will be able to detect those and use them. So that's our idea, to pick up this uh, signature through EEG and use them in real time for our patients. But that's, that's not novel, but, and we know that there are some challenges to doing this. First thing, training. Training on brain-computer interface is extremely long, tiresome, and complex. It's complex in setup, it's complex uh, in the task itself, and it's long and it's tiresome because it requires sustained attention for a long time. Another thing is brain-computer interfaces, despite being a tool that has been around for about two decades or so, being exploited in, in research like this, it still lacks reliability. Those systems are just not reliable enough to be used just out of the box. Then another limitation and consequence of that is that these are hardly used outside lab labs or clinical experiments because of these limitations. And then there's a factor related to the high cost of these systems. These systems now costs are going down, but if we look for systems like the Enovio, we are talking about the simplest system with eight electrodes, about 10,000 euros, so, which is definitely a substantial amount of money. So our ideas combine um, brain-computer interfaces based on sensory motor rhythms and then the um, uh, virtual reality and see how we can use virtual reality to enhance the activation, these activation in motor areas. Assuming that the more activated they, they are, that's better for driving cortical plasticity and relearning. So then we want to, to use multimodality, immersive VR, because of these things we've talked about, um, uh, mirror neurons. Um, and we want to maximize the engagement first of users to make the sessions that are tiresome and complex um, more uh, sustainable, and second, to drive these sensory motor networks that are responsible for uh, uh, recovery. So when we look at normal uh, neurofeedback or motor imagery-based uh, trainings or applications look very much like this where we are given a cue, like think right, and you think right, and then you see a small bar on that arrow. So let's say the ecological validity of what is known as the Gratz visualization is quite limited, especially if we want to drive the mirror neuron system, we want people to embed a first-person perspective uh, body. There have been improvements and, and proposals, and we have more realistic uh, paradigms in which you have, um, you see still on the left, the typical bar of the Gratz visualization, but on the right you see a hand that's trying to mimic what you're thinking, right? Like you're thinking, I'm closing the hand, you see the hand closing, okay? So we gain their ecological validity. Now the question is, is this really sufficient for, for what we want to do? And our, our point here, our hypothesis is, I think we can do much better with the virtual reality we have right now, and this could make a difference. So, what we want to do basically is exploit these um, sensory motor rhythms to change things in the environment, but also provide at the same time through immersive virtual reality illusions of body ownership that they are immersed in a virtual uh, environment and they do have a virtual body and that they control this body. They are active agents and they own this body. 
And we think that these factors can improve neurofeedback uh, when we compare it to the previous one. So let me show you um, one study we, we did where we wanted to, to understand to what extent adding VR or not adding VR can help in driving these, these sensory motor rhythms, these areas, uh, sensory motor areas. So we uh, performed um, acquisition over the sensory motor areas, as you see here, with a G-Mobile app system. We had people using uh, an Oculus Rift, the first development version. Um, we provided them with sound, consistent with the task at hand. And we combined it with leap motion. Okay? And I'm going to explain why. But all of this integrated in a single system, where we would record movement, we would record brain activity, and we would present a virtual uh, environment um, to, the, to the participants. We tested this with nine uh, healthy participants. And it's important to say that all of them were naive. They were not experts in this. This is one of the biases we see sometimes in brain-computer interface research, that subjects are actually overtrained to the technology. This is not the case here. So the first question we, we asked, and that was based on, on research um, available, is if we want to have this motor imagery training to think about a motor action, it helps a lot to have perform the motor action before, immediately before. That's what we call motor priming. So you perform this motor action just before performing the motor imagery. That means that you will have a fresh memory of what this is like, and this can contribute to performing a better motor imagery. Um, and it has been shown that priming the motor cortex can also improve neuroplasticity and also the outputs in motor performance. So we wanted to see, can we exploit this and test it in a brain-computer VR paradigm? So we performed, we, we performed an experiment with three conditions. The first one was virtual reality motor priming. This was a system that would have the participant performing a motor action with his, her hands. Okay, This would be represented in a virtual environment through the head-mounted display, and we would record the, the brain activity. And then after this motor priming session, we would have a motor imagery session in which they would exploit what they just um, trained in here. The second um, condition would be exclusively VR without the motor priming, and the third one would be using the uh, grads visualization. So we wanted to see those having one visualization or another, or even motor priming, change how the, we recruit the motor networks. So let me show you. This would be the motor priming condition. You see? Would move the arms, but would only see the virtual body, completely correlated what he would be doing through the, the leap motion. Okay? And the task would be very simple, would be if you're Given the go for um, a right hand, you have to lift the door of this garage with a lever with the right hand, if it's with the left, with the left hand. But you see, now the task has a specific meaning. It's not a, a hand or an arrow outside of a context. This is actually a, an actual motor task that you may be performing in real life. This group would also perform then the virtual uh, reality uh, motor imagery task, which is this one here. In this group here, we only had people performing the motor imagery training, but not motor priming. But instead of showing the arrow where you say, OK, think of the right hand, and then you see an arrow going right, goes left, and now you think of the left hand, you would see a virtual hand on the right doing the motor action. You would see a virtual hand on the left doing the motor action. And finally, the control condition that would be the standard grads visualization. And this is how, how it works. So you see an arrow, and then you have to think, I'm thinking right. Now I, th I see an arrow, I have to think, I'm thinking left. But remember, th these are sensory motor areas that we want to recruit, and they are very sensitive to the sensory input we, we have. right? So this is why we wanted to provide a virtual body that performs these tasks. 
So the experiment um, went like this. We had um, uh, set up about 15 minutes. Uh, so it would take about an hour, all of it. Then we would have a training uh, that we call uh, BCI calibration, where we would compute um, the, um, the features that we wanted to use, the, the, the classifiers, etc. We'd have a little bit of resting, and then we would continue with the exploitation of that. We would have one group, let's see, uh, yeah, one group here that would use um, this visualization and the other one that would use virtual reality instead of, of the arrow. Okay. What data we collected? First, the classifier score. We didn't invent here. We use a very standard linear discriminant analysis uh, for, the, for the classification based on um, um, the common spatial patterns. So everything very standard. Second, questioners. We wanted to understand how this, the effect of VR would influence their, their, um, their presence sense. Uh, so we use the presence questionnaire, also workload through the NASA TLX, and also we wanted to understand how this performance would relate to their kinesthetic imagery, and there are questionnaires dedicated to evaluating that. And then we assessed the, 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 the power in the different frequency bands, alpha, beta, zeta, and gamma. This is uh, what we found. Okay? This is I think interpreting what's on each band is beyond what we wanted to do. But look here, given our setup, we could record the activity, the EEG, during motor action and also during motor imagery. So we have two controls here. We have a control that is, this is performing the motor action. So that's, we want to get close to that. And then we have the other control, which is, the grads visualization. That's the standard neurofeedback uh, that you get on motor imagery. So here we have VR, and here we have VR with motor priming. And the interesting thing is that you can see changes modulated just because of the medium you have, you have used. Is this resting state within after the experiment? Or? No, this is during the motor imagery. This is the power of those bands during motor imagery. This is a single. Uh, measurement that uh, assesses the power um, in the in the motor fun in the motor areas. Yeah. The absolute, the absolute power. So that's what I'm saying. It's very difficult to interpret what it means, and different bands have different meaning. But what I want to to bring here is we basically want to get close to what motor action is, right? And what we see is that even with such a simple metric, we see a trend when we include virtual reality motor priming towards the, the sort of patterns that we see when we have actual motor activity in the different frequency bands, which is an indicator that actually this virtual reality can be, um, can be a good tool to drive farther um, these, these, these these motor networks in a similar way as we would expect from motor action. When we look at the performance, we see that motor, um, motor priming plus uh, virtual reality performs slightly better. There is a slight trend, but it's not significant. Okay? But there is a, a trend there, and in the worst case, it's not worse than our control. So findings that we, we see out of this. So this suggests that using multimodal VR feedback and motor priming can help um, uh, increasing uh, training performance. And we also found in the, um, in the questionnaires um, that there was a relationship which is sort of uh, logical with the kinesthetic imagery and the beta band, which is where we um, uh, find the sensory motor rhythms. So we, we have uh, tools now to use kinesthetic imagery questionnaires to recruit and see which participants may benefit the most from uh, this type of intervention, because we can assess that before having them inside uh, of the setup. Now, knowing 
this, what's the next step? So our next step was to improve neurofeedback using VR. We have shown VR can help in enhancing uh, the activity of the motor networks, and that's something we want uh, in a similar fashion as the, um, the, the actual motor task. But if we want to do a task that goes to the clinic, what do we do? So based on um, the guidelines defined by Lotte et al., we basically define the task that um, would provide uh, positive feedback, clear and meaningful feedback, would make clear what's the gap between what your current performance is and what the actual desired performance is, would be multimodal and engaging. These are guidelines that are provided to us. Clear goals um, and the meaning of the feedback explained, and we uh, demonstrate the skill that has to be uh, learned. And at the task level, here comes where we put the Yerkes and Dodson uh, principle. The task should be challenging, but achievable to have this optimal uh, spot in the stress versus performance curve. And exploit uh, VR as a motivator in, in this task. So these are things that we took into account, and we developed um, a system designed to go to the clinic and to be exploited in um, a motor imagery neurofeedback uh, setting for rehabilitation. So how it works, the first phase is training, in which you have um, the motor imagery action, you imagine an action, and you will see on virtual reality this being performed, but also we developed a vibrotractile system that you would feel on your hand also the action that's being performed in virtual reality. This would be used to learn the classifiers, etc., and then the exploitation, uh, that would be the performance of the task, would be based on an analysis of the, of the EEG, uh, doing the standard processing that would be used as control signals to drive this virtual reality environment. So how does this system look like? Looks like this. Again, we have um, um, the brain, uh, the EEG acquisition system. In this case, again, the G-Mobile app um, over the sensory motor um, areas. Second, head-mounted display. Again, we want the person to embody a virtual avatar because of all we said before. We provide virtual feedback. and I'm going to talk a little bit about this. And we developed a haptic feedback system that would increase the validity and the consistency of the feedback you get through virtual reality. So let me show you. This is a snapshot of what we call the neuro game um, that's being developed for this. So the patient is sitting on a chair with the hands on top of a table holding the vibrators. But he can freely move the head and observe around this virtual environment. And this virtual environment has a body exactly placed where the, the patient would expect uh, his body to be. And you see it's a realistic body in which he can perform actions. Whenever an action is performed, and this is a rowing action to orient the boat towards one direction or another, the respective hand receives a vibration from the, from the, the haptic system. And on top of that, we would add uh, surround sound, okay? trying to make it as realistic as possible. This is how the system looks like being operated by, by a user. So um, it's completely uh, motor imagery driven. And here you will see one thing. This is self-paced, which is very different to, to the standard motor imagery paradigms in which you are told, think right. You think right, and you have a window. Here, the participant can think whatever he wants at any time. Okay? And we detect that, and then we change directions in real time according to that. What it has to do is drive this boat to the flags that appear there. Whenever it gets a flag, this flag disappears. You get some points, and a new flag will appear. And then he has to reorient through motor imagery thinking this motor action that's being represented with the right or with the left hand. So, in a way, this is 
very ecologically valid. It represents uh, a virtual body performing the actions that it's being intended by the participant at the same time that receives feedback through haptic uh, channels. So this system that we developed, um, we actually made an effort to, to make it available. Um, we think that um, we are sometimes worrying too much about the technology itself and not the application. So this application we have developed in Unity, we have uh, three versions, one that can work on a desktop, another one that can work on mobile VR that's using uh, a phone with this 20 euro headset connected um, to a computer, so you don't need a head-mounted display. You can do it low cost, and also in, in web browser, in which case you wouldn't need a, a virtual reality helmet. This is um, available uh, there um, in our website, and we'll be happy to, to receive feedback on it. So one of the things we did was, OK, so how do people perform? What's the performance of this system compared to other systems? Here you have a, um, a series of 12 studies. Those are 12 studies that we have managed uh, to find performance data that we could compare. And the ones with the star are systems with the exact same configuration. So those are our, our studies or studies using exactly the same um, hardware configuration and training paradigm. And we see that uh, of the ones that have the same configuration, we would perform uh, quite high, and we would be um, the fourth of the different systems we have seen. Now, take into account that we are using naive subjects, and these systems that we compare not always have naive subjects as users of the brain-computer interface systems. Things that we found when using Nero. First, we saw a low physical demand in the, in the questioners, in the NASA TLX, but we saw also a good classification performance. So it seems that it's a good and a positive tool that we could incorporate in, in, in rehabilitation. And the second thing, I think that's positive that can uh, support long-term uh, use of this is an increased flow and immersion with the task, and also an increased positive effect uh, when compared to the standard GRADS visualization. So this could be exploited to engage uh, users in these brain-computer interface trainings. Come. So, so far, we have um, built um, a system, something that can be used, and it's a paradigm that could be uh, exploited in, in, in motor rehabilitation. But we faced a very uh, important problem, which is the interaction. We worry a lot about the classification, improving classification in systems, but when we come to interacting with a virtual reality system, we have a situation that probably an open loop uh, a self-paced system that we didn't have before. What is the problem? We have a self-paced system, and people, and most likely our system, will make mistakes in detecting what is right motor imagery from what is left motor imagery. We're using simple classifiers that basically draw a line, a statistical line, but there are going to be mistakes. Uh, these mistakes and performance will depend on the user training, will depend on the equipment used, whether we use active electrodes or passive electrodes or dry electrodes. All of this changes completely the situation. The number of channels is not the same using an eight-channel equipment than using 32 doing exactly the same processing. Or even the algorithms using um, SVN or using LDA. So performances change. But the truth is those are generally quite low. And when we want to use a system in real time, we have to take decisions based on this. It's a challenge. So by looking at um, studies using different um, classification algorithms, you see here uh, SVMs, linear discriminant analysis, uh, Markov model, etc., we see that performances 
do not have a clear winner what's the best technology to use. Also, the data is so sparse that we cannot tell for which configuration the best algorithm is or for which paradigm. So that puts us in a problem because we don't know how to solve it from the classification point of view. So our approach to this was, OK, we may not be able to solve this. As you see here, we go from 61% to 87%. And our participants will go some values in between or even lower. How do we deal with these error rates when people are thinking they want to do something and this something doesn't happen? It happens the opposite. So our approach is, OK, let's, let's forget about solving the problem of the classification and let's try to solve the problem of the interaction. What does that mean? OK, so if the classifier decides wants to go right or wants to go left, that's fine with us. So what we did is we created a layer on top of the classifier that would basically look at the likelihood, the correctness of a specific classification output okay, in the past. So given the training data and given this classification with this specific value, what is the likelihood that is correct? So using simple Bayesian inference. And then we would put this into a state machine in which we would define several states that you will see. What's the idea here? The idea here is to avoid taking decisions that are likely to be the wrong decision. So as opposed to use directly the classifier output, what we did is we basically learned when the classifier is most likely incorrect. So we don't take wrong actions. Okay? And then this is what we send to the virtual reality environment to be controlled. This is an example of the system working with a different game. You see this S0. That is, you have data that it has no confidence that's either right or left, very low confidence. So we say it's in the state 0. Then we have a number of states in the state machine that um, represent increasing levels of confidence of your action. So as the system uh, detects um, increasing likelihood of you thinking right or left, it will represent this as a state in here. And now what we have turned is a binary action space, which is left or right, into a space that can have a needle position and can know about the likelihood of actions are being correct or incorrect. And how we do that, as I said, not taking the decisions that we know they are not correct. So what you can see in this plot is the actual average performance of the system that would be without our, our technology that's turned off. And when we use this system, you see the number of indecisions start increasing. And as I decide not to take decisions at some point, my overall performance in the decisions I take increases. Okay, Meaning that when we are interacting with a virtual reality environment, it's much better not to take a decision than to take the wrong decision and provide bad feedback to the, um, to the patient. Okay. Comparing this to um, the classification performances that we could see in, in this table that's shown before, we see that the LDA classification, that would be the, the, the standard without our um, decision-taking system, that the APE that would not perform an improvement, would be 65%. Whenever we turn on this machine to take less decisions, it goes up to uh, even higher values than 80 in some cases. So this system um, allows us to, to have um, an adaptation on demand. So instead of overtraining patients for sessions and sessions to have them performing at a good level, we basically change the decisions. So decisions that are likely to be incorrect are not being taken. So better performing users will have um, less indecisions, whereas uh, worse performing users will have more, uh, more indecisions, which enhances the usability of such a system. And I would like to, to finalize talking just about um, the hardware. 
the, the cost and benefit of the actual uh, brain computer interfaces um, or EEG acquisition systems that exist in the market. So for this study, we, um, we got inspired by the work by Nibor um, in 2015, where he looked at the different usability um, factors of uh, different um, EEG systems using a paradigm that's called the P300. That's the spelling over there. It's a completely different paradigm. He did that experiment, and we thought that we could do a very similar one on the motor imagery, which is the one related to our task. So what did Nibor do? So he got these three systems, very different systems, a biosemi, which is a medical-grade medical -grade system with 32 electrodes, would take an emotive, which is a gaming system with 14 electrodes that has been uh, already discussed in this conference, and a G Sahara, which is a research grade system that uses dry electrodes, and would compare these systems. We wanted to do something similar on motor imagery. So in this study, what we did is we compared three systems that are available. Um, one of them is the um, OpenBCI, which is an open source EEG hardware system with eight electrodes that we developed ourselves in the lab. Second one is an Enovio system, that's a commercial system um, produced uh, in Spain. And the third one, the GMobile Lab, that's a system uh, produced um, in Austria by GTAC Technologies. All of them have very similar specifications. One is an open, um, uh, open source system and the other two are commercial. The price of the first one is about 300 euros. The price of the second one is about 10,000. The price of the third one, I don't even know if it's commercialized anymore because there's a, a newer version of this, but at the time it was about 20,000 euros. So is it worth it? That's the main question. So looking at the usability, what we see as P300, that's what has been shown in the, in the experiment by Niebuhr, and in motor imagery, that's what we did. So when we look at the speed of setup, we see that all of them are set up basically with the same time. When we look at the ease of setup, there is not much difference. The OpenBCI seems to be uh, more complicated. When we look at comfort, there is not much difference. Remember, all of them are, um, are eight electrode systems with very similar characteristics. All of them use gel, so the setup is very similar. Appearance, uh, G-Mobile app, which is probably the oldest of them all, uh, got the, the worst appearance. And when we measure the real time to set up in the motor imagery, it takes less time with the G-Mobile app. When we look at the estimation of time, it doesn't make much of a difference. The, the message here is, well, we don't see huge differences between these three systems that have very similar characteristics. What happens when we look at performance? This is the performance identified in a P300 paradigm by the Biosemi Emotive and, and G Sahara, and we produce these ones here. Okay? With the, Novio, the mobile app and the EG, we see that Inovio mobile app have higher performances than open um, aging, although these differences are not that large. When we look at the P300, we can see huge discrepancies because this is a 32 electrode system. So it's normal and expectable that this performs better in terms of uh, performance. Now the question is, you see this increase in performance, is it worth, I'm about, about to finish, thanks. Is it worth the money? And that's the question we wanted to answer. So we, plot in the, we plotted in this cost effectiveness uh, curve where we have here what is uh, more expensive, okay, less effective, what is um, uh, cost saving, okay, and what is cost saving more effective, the performances and the cost of these systems. Okay? And basically, we divided the performance we measured by the cost of them, and we ranked them. And Interesting thing is here, you can see that the performances of this system, which are all eight electrode systems, uh, the motive is 14 electrode, but are very similar configurations. They are all very close around uh, this performance, whereas they vary a lot in cost. So just by 
using a very um, um, agnostic cost effectiveness, what would be the choice? And actually, uh, a system like the Open EG, despite having a low performance, what we get for the cost of it um, is, is, is quite good, then followed by the Emotive, and then Inovio, G Mobile App, G Sahara, and Biosemi. Although, if I would ever have to make sure that I want the best performance, I would go for the Biosemi. But what I'm looking here is just the cost effectiveness of these systems. So, what I'm showing here is we have technology, VR, mobile VR, we have brain computer interfaces up on hardware projects that are cost effective, and these technologies are coming to a point that they could make a difference and could be deployed for um, uh, effective rehabilitation in the hospitals. So we see similar effectiveness, di no differences in comfort appearances uh, or speed of ease, therefore, low cost option is cost effective. Now, to conclude, so have you seen, we, we have jumped through many different um, disciplines, and, and this is something um, that I always like to say. We work with uh, clinicians, with the therapists, with the patients, so I want to acknowledge that this is a teamwork uh, done uh, by many people with different profiles, um, that we develop uh, VR experiences that are and should be personalized and engaging. They should em embody neuroscientific uh, principles of recovery to justify why they should be better than any other technology. We showed that existing, existing low-cost uh, technologies may be effective and that um, we can provide through these technologies alternative uh, rehabilitation paradigms that do not exist at this moment. So these are technologies that are needed at the hospital for those patients that do not have other alternative um, rehabilitation approaches. So um, we see immersion, presence, and embodiment can be effective to drive uh, motor imagery in uh, brain-computer VR uh, setup. We have seen the, the cost effectiveness of local systems, and we are currently now uh, working on a one-month intervention with this system um, at the, um, at the hospital of Funchal, where we are having pre and post uh, fMRI um, of these patients plus clinical scales to see not only the improvements in clinical scales, but also how we uh, modulated um, um, th those motor networks that we wanted to modulate uh, through this paradigm. And I want to finish with this. I want to thank um, you and especially those people over there. and. Thanos, who is the guy here who did uh, most of the brain-computer interface work. Um, and without these people, I wouldn't be able to present any of this work. Thank you.